All right. Well, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I've been trying to get out here for a number of years. Uh, always had something conflicting with it, whether it's ASA national meetings or just had another meeting going on, so I'm glad it worked out this year. Uh, I'm the soybean agronomist up in Indiana, uh, Purdue University, and so I'm going to talk about kind of how things have changed with soybeans. Uh, we've had the opportunity to work with some of these old soybeans, so 1920s to present, and so we've, we've had a number of studies over the years looking at this in a management by genetic interaction as well as uh, now kind of get into more of the, the nutrient side of things. So this is just more something to, to kind of think about how things have changed in terms of the way they, they grow and develop. And then what do we need to do as agronomists, as farmers, as consultants to, to change our mindset as well? Um, I very much like a conversation. So if you guys have a question in the middle, please ask. Uh, I've got more slides than, than I've got time for. I'm an extension guy from the Midwest. So we always do that. Um, my counterpart, Bob Nelson, uh, corn agronomist, has said, Sean, you know, don't embarrass me, okay? We'll see how, we'll see how that goes, okay? So, at any rate, uh, soybean nutrient needs. These aren't your grandpa's varieties, okay? Any idea when the last real amount of fertility work was done on soybeans? Give me a year or a decade. 50s, okay. 70s. 70s? 80s. 80s? 20s. 20s? Okay, so how many, show of hands, how many think uh, this 1950s was the last time we really did fertility work? Okay, 1970s, 1980s, or I'll say it depends, right? You know, does that go all the way down here too, right? 1970s, really. Late 1960s, 1970s is really the last amount of fertility work done on soybeans in a major way. Uh, so it, it really kind of begs a lot of our questions. So we started with some of these old soybeans and new, looking at different management scenarios. So back in 2010, 2011, uh, we came on board uh, with uh, four of the Midwest uh, universities, so Illinois, Purdue, where I'm located, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, to look at some of these old soybeans to, to new soybeans and to see if there's any synergy with management. And so you, you give you an idea, you know, we've got 1927 and 1964, 71 and 2001, okay? What strikes you about those pictures? The leaf size, okay? What about the leaf size? The old ones are big. Okay, let's go um, 64, certainly the, the 20s and 30s. I mean, those were forage beans. They were introduced, they are really more of a forage bean. But even the 60s, uh, the leaflet, the leaflet, the size of my hand. So if I you know, was a mutant and had a third hand. You can idea, have an idea of what this trifoliate looked like. Now we go to the mo more modern lines, something in the 2000s. You know, those leaflets, and more like the trifoliates, just expand my hand a little bit. That's the trifolia. Okay, so again, try to give it a little perspective. The older lines, leaflet, so it's like this hand, trifoliate the modern line, just a little bit expanded. That's the difference we're talking about. Okay, huge difference. What else do you see with that picture? Row spacing, so these are all the same row spacing, they're 30s. So with that, what are you really seeing with the 2000 versus 64? Yeah, standability, uh, it's rec, a lodging, okay, all the same seeding rate. So these are some of the things that genetics have, have kind of come into play. Uh, some of our first four studies with this were just kind of this yes, no. We had 60 cultivars. Okay. That's a lot, okay. 60 cultivars that we did this kind of yes-no comparison. And so we looked at planting date in early May versus in early June, uh, nitrogen, so is there any limitations to the top end yield of soybeans? And so this is kind of the, the study that our, our group led. We all did all four studies, but we, we poured it to it, 500 pounds of nitrogen, okay? We knocked out fixation completely, we made great company with EPA and everyone else, and we got 12 bushel gains which you can do the math, doesn't work out, right? But the top end yield potential is still there to have more. Uh, CD rates low to high, as well as disease package. We did nothing versus Cadillac seed treatments, foliar fungicide. So that's, that's kind of where we started in 2010, 2011 with these guys. Uh, some of the findings out of that was there was a synergy. So when you put it across uh, release year, you put it with these agronomic management practices, you know, there was a synergy with earlier planting. The modern lines actually yielded more when they were planted timely. 
not just a constant. It was a eight bushel versus you know the 1960s. There was a synergy. There was actually a divergence. So as you came to more modern lines, the yield potential, the yield with that management practice, was like bigger than something in the 1960s. Okay. Same thing on the nitrogen front yeah, on a per acre per year basis. One of the things that kind of got us more and more on the nutrient side of things was what we saw with this nitrogen study. Okay, you know, 500 pounds, sure, that's that's absurdly too much. But you knock out fixation. You look at the genetic potential, and you have these associations with greater leaf nitrogen concentration. You also have better leaf nitrogen accumulation. That goes right part and parcel with the amount of photosynthetic activity. Talk what is that doing for pod retention and seed yield later in the season? Uh, allocation of these nutrients. For instance, if I just pulled out the uh, nitrogen allocation up to R6, so R6 is going to be full seed. Okay, the amount of nitrogen I was allocated to those leaves on the 1923 line was about 21 percent. If we looked at it with the modern line, the 2011, nearly a third of that nitrogen was allocated to the leaves. Okay, these are kind of just kind of quick take homes up front, and then I get into the weeds, and then I come back out of the weeds. Okay. Then total removal okay. of the, all the nitrogen that was taken up, 64% of it in the old lines were removed in the grain. Now we go to the modern lines, we have three quarters of the total nitrogen. So we take up more nitrogen with our modern lines and we're removing more with the grain. So if we're thinking about removing more with the grain, there's two ways that can is Okay. Why do we grow soybeans? And please don't say it's a rotation crop. Why do we grow soybeans? Protein, right? What's the building blocks of protein? Amino acids, nitrogen, right? Mineral and the possibility for this greater nitrogen removal is to do what to the grain? One to the protein. So the second option is what? And this amount of protein in the grain. In other words, the nitrogen content in the grain is not increasing. You're producing more. And in fact, we're actually producing more dry matter yield. That's what we get paid on right now. We happen to have a good protein source, and, and we get paid for it, but we don't get any premiums for it. But we still have protein at acceptable levels, and we have yields that are even higher. Our protein's actually going down, okay, over these release years, but our quantity's going up, and we're still getting paid the same price. So that's how we're removing more nitrogen on a per acre basis: is that we have more dry matter. Under this hot state. Protein levels are going down. There's also an inverse relationship with protein and yield. Okay? Protein packs a, a powerful punch. Okay? We have way more energy packed into protein of soybeans than, than that other crop of corn, right? So it takes three times the amount of photosynthate to really get that same protein packed into soybeans. So you can kind of understand why it takes three times less yield and soybean versus corn, all right? Does that kind of make sense, all right? Just kind of understanding how these things have changed. All right, so let's uh, drill down a little bit on these. And uh, we took those 60 cultivars, and we kind of went down to 25 cultivars to intensely look at nutrient allocation across a growing season. And so we looked at biomass and all the maximum micronutrients across these 90 years. So 25 or so cultivars that we, we selected to represent. So, kind of the Bible, if you will, of soybean growth and development out of Iowa, right? The soybean growth and development as updated by Ella back in 2009. Seems pretty recent, right? You go in, you open it up. Here's the cumulative total nitrogen taken up. Based on the different components of your plant, you got those that are leaves, those are stems, those are fallen leaves, uh, and you kind of go through the transitions to seeds, right? This is the standard. This is nitrogen across the growing season. So, so we the, oh, let's go R4. We've got a yeah, maybe it. nitrogen taken up by R4. Guess what this is based on? You guys already answered it. 2009 publication, data is from 1971 publication. Uh, so a lot of the varieties that are in Hanway and Weber publication, that's in the background of this, we have in our study. So they're late 1960s varieties, maturity group two. Okay. So again, there hasn't been much work done at all. So that's what we want to look at. V4, R2, R4, R6, and R8. And they kind of go across the season 
and we partitioned everything down to leaves and stems, pods that are developing, and then switched over uh, to the seeds. The idea that we ran two, two studies with this, maturity group two. Limestone. So trying to get one to two. Neutralize the pH. With nearly the decade, okay. Obviously, Look at the we got some of the uh, We don't have as many to choose from, so we could only get one for that decade. And then same thing with the three. So roughly uh, on the order of 25, 26 varieties, if I recall. Um, Partitioned it like I've, like I've already talked about. So a lot of labor with this. Okay, how many went downstairs and, and heard Wes's talk on resistant uh, glyphosate, resistant polymer, right? What was one of his management strategies with that once you've got it? Some to tie up phosphorus. Tell me what the phosphorus like. To hand labor, right? It took a lot of labor to do this, too, okay? We're pulling beans, we're pulling leaves, we're pulling pods. Uh, fortunately for you guys, you don't live near me, otherwise I would kind of get you involved with this. That's a lot of labor. So, uh, we commented earlier about higher nitrogen concentrations, how they go toward the leaf retention as well as photosynthetic capacity. Um, every single growth stage across these release years, we saw more, more nitrogen in those components, okay? 1923, sometimes the pictures definitely do a better justice than my little take home bullets. 1943, 64, 2011. Okay, these are all the same growth stage. Okay, you guys have already hit on the leaf size. I keep standing right in front of you, you just kicked me out of the way. All right, leaf size, we've talked about that. We talked about lodging or how, how direct they stand. What else do you see now? Greener. Dark, dark green. Right? Crazy dark. So what do you think that's associated with? Nitrogen and sulfur. I've led you down the path of just nitrogen, but it's nitrogen and sulfur, which is going to really what? The chlorophyll. And again, go down this road of better leaf retention, more nitrogen concentration. Uh, you guys don't have to deal with it as much as we do in the Midwest. You get some of these cooler temperatures. Drown R6 in August, September, we actually shut down photosynth photosynthesis in a really major way. And it takes a while to get it back up unless we've got a high concentration of nitrogen. Okay, so th that was the major thing that's really coming out of it. Again, this is all R6. Okay? Point where we've talked about nitrogen accumulation in soybeans has maxed out around R6, R6.5, and, a half, and then, then you're done, right? When's the latest you guys do any management uh, activities in soybeans? What growth stage? R3. R3? And what, what is that typically? Yeah, so it's first bod, and then what, what do you guys typically do with that? Yeah, foliar fungicide, maybe insecticide, right? Maybe some will play with a little bit of foliar feeding. R3 is about it. Does anyone that do, does anything later besides the irrigators? If you're an irrigator, you should be running until R6.5, R7, but... Okay, so normally we do R3 and we're done. We don't even think about doing anything else. This is just really just kind of gets you to think about, should we be doing or at least being out there and looking at what's going on? A lot of our thresholds on insects, for instance, um, you've got to get crazy high numbers with aphids when we get up to R4, R5, you know, 1,000, 2,000 instead of two, 250 plants, uh, aphids per plant. Or if we want to look at bean leaf beetle feeding or a stink bug, you've got to get some numbers based on the data. What I'm really going to share with you is what's going on so much later in our season with these modern lines. It really needs to kind of put our head on, uh, on down our feet and think about them differently and manage and scout. Okay. There we go. So we did all these growth stage, but for the sake of today's talk, I just want to really kind of drill down to this R6 a little bit later. Uh, partition it down to here in blue is going to be our pods. Stems are going to be the pink, and then uh, there in green is going to be our leaves. Okay, across uh, the bottom axis there, the X is your old line, 1920s to the 2011 line. Okay, so what transition we really see? Let me take that back if I can. There we go. It's fairly flat, and then we get about 1970s or so. They increase. Pretty stark increase okay what do you think happened around the 1970s besides no more fertility work in soybeans yeah uh, surface applied related in the 10 ton 
uh, application rate. Uh, they're I've never seen this whole way. But really point and the private industry came into play. Okay. They mixed it here because they mixed it in the bear and they didn't mix it in the grass. Uh, but the you know the USDA, the, the government, the, the university breeding programs field before the can be closed it, and the grass conditions it helps the hay. private industry say I'm really going to play out with this so I can have a, a product at the end. And so they're going hard to get greater yields, maybe a little bit more on the disease resistance. But all the while, whether they know or not, we have a major change in the way they're holding on to their leaves. So that could be some disease resistance. It could be maybe their they their pubescence is a little hairy, so they don't get insects that are coming in there. But you saw the picture, and I've got the data on the nitrogen side as well. It's increasing the amount of nitrogen and sulfur, okay? And that helps with this leaf retention. So if you're holding on to the leaves longer, you're going to have the opportunity to do what? Remobilize, right? Remobilize photosynthate to the pods, hold on to those pods, and to finish filling them out, okay? Uh, this is where I think the transitions were a little slow with both of these guys. Yeah. So to kind of put it in perspective, we grew these old lines to new in today's environment. And so there's always a question, okay, does this really mean anything? In other lines? And so I pulled out over the list three, but co-application is way too vague. Three, 1970, 2011, and the partition. They're gypsum rate for ton per acre, and they being again that hand Weber paper, the soybean growth and development. How does this compare to what they actually showed back in 1971? So again, you see the change from 1970, 24 percent of the total nitrogen in the leaves, whereas 2011, nearly a third of its nitrogen is in the leaves. Okay, that's another way of kind of showing this data. You see, no, not much of a change with the stems. You do see a major change or shift in the pods. So they've got 56 percent. In the pods in 1970, modern line only 50%. Okay, so in other words, the older lines are doing a little bit more mid reproductive growth. Our newer ones are doing more later. Okay, how does this compare with Hanway and Weber? You know, I couldn't fake this. All right, this is uh, unless I actually said it's basically the old paper 21% We said 24%. Pods 57%, or they said 57, we said 56. We're spot on. Okay. So their old lines, their study versus what we did today, it's spot on. And so now our modern lines certainly have changed. Okay. I'm going to pass this because I think I'm going to be long-winded today. Here's maybe a, a better way to look at it. You, know, you get all those lines, you get all those dots and those regressions. So I decided let's do it on a, a partition basis. So. We took three cultivars to average in the background of the 1930s, 1960s, 2000, or 1980s, and 2010s. We've got dark green to the leaves. This kind of olive green is going to be the stems, and then what's eventually the stover. And then orange is going to be pods initially, and then transitioning over to the seeds. Okay. So for the sake of time, let's just concentrate on these right to the 1960s again. Last time we really did fertility work as well as 2010. Point. Uh, Let me go back. So, topped out with nitrogen allocation on the maturity group two set and then it kind of drops down. Modern line R6 is right here. We have a slight increase and we hold, hold out. We don't drop down. Okay? That may not look like a big difference, so I switched it around. Let me get that thing going. About a five second delay. R6 pod seed, 1960s. So we go from about 60% in uh, the pods to about 75% by the end of the season. Modern line, we go from that 50%, so not as much taken up by R6, and we go up to about 90%. Straight linear increase from R6 to the end of the season. Okay? Forge a year. They're not doing much more after R6. Yeah. Put on a lot. And, and uh, pounds. Uh, this is the twos. We're seeing the same thing in the threes, just uh, maybe not as strong. For those it's increasing pretty heavily from a oh, 50%. It may look like a super high. Eight. But you look at the 1960s again, it's maybe 56% up to 60%. It's not doing much of anything. Okay, that's the nice side of things. Phosphorus, uh, showing very similar. This is the one where I really want to kind of drill down on the leaves themselves. Where do you see the point where it's dark green? Again, we'll just look at the 1960s and 2010s. Where do you see the leaf 
accumulation max out with the 1960s. We got V4, R2, R4, R6, and R8. Where is it peaking? R4, right? Right there. When does soybeans typically stop growing vegetatively? R5, R5 and a half, give or take a little bit. So that matches up fairly well. Maxes out there, then drops down. What about the modern lines? Where does it max? R5, R4, I'm hearing later. You have more of a hill. As you can see, no difference between the gyptons. You have more of a hill down here. We and the thought here is, is that it's coming up about R3 almost and holding and holding and holding. Starts to drop down R5 and a half, R6, and then goes down. Okay? So this is phosphorus accumulation. It's coming up earlier in the season and it's holding on much longer. Okay? Does that make sense to everyone? This first half of the talk is really about what's changed. And then you guys as practitioners are like, okay, so what? What am I going to do with it? I can see it on your faces, okay? I'm getting there. If I don't get it at the end of this talk, I talk tomorrow, I'll use it tomorrow, okay? Uh, we've got some fertility by foliar management interactions that are really showing some interesting results. So uh, I have a feeling it's not going to be this talk. It'll be tomorrow's talk that I'll only 16 days. All right? Same kind of deal. We're going to pick this up. Uh, but the idea that you're doing a strong amount of work after R6, okay? And it lags on me on this slide. That's fine. Let's keep it. Again, look at that straight line increase versus this guy. Okay? Don't go fishing yet. You know, R6 and beyond. All right, typically what we, I think of just rules of thumb is how long are we in these reproductive stages, R1 down to R6, R7. Again, I'm talking indeterminate beings. Let me make sure we're clear about that too, right? Uh, so, five. The soils are formed on sandstone, and they are very, very deep, sandy soils. When we get to R5 and R6, we got 15 days in R5, 20 days in R6. Those two growth stages are still that same month that we talked about the first four growth stages. Okay. So, again, just posing the question. I'm not saying I've got the answer that, yeah, we need to do late season management, but we at least need to be thinking about what's going on so much later with these modern lines, R5, R6. Uh, for us, the, the month that really makes or breaks soybeans, is it the same thing down here? August is our month that makes or breaks soybeans, right? Very similar, right? August, September. Guess what, what that's matching up to? Is it whether you get a hurricane or not? Is that what I just heard about September? Yeah. Same thing yep. I, I lived in North Carolina for eight years, so I, I understand. I an NC State grad, and my wife's from Wilmington, so I understand this whole uh, hurricane thing. She's more afraid of tornadoes, though, than hurricanes. I don't get that. I'm from Illinois. A month or so, and then trying to finish out. What do we do with that? Uh, how many do uh, tissue sampling in soybeans? Okay. How often do you take uh, leaf samples? Okay, so this is what I found. found. They reported the percent at a location where they were monitoring the... Uh, the runoff with that. What about crops do you guys uh, bolt on or farm? So we got soybeans, obviously. Corn, wheat, any other crops? Any spuds in the crowd? No potatoes? Maybe? Any strawberries? I'm just, I'm bringing up some of these other crops that are pretty intensively monitored. Right? I spent this as agronomist from North Carolina giving nutrient recommendations from Fraser for Christmas trees to blueberries to tobacco. Right? And so there's some very intensely monitored crops out there. Potatoes are that way. How often are we thinking about soybeans in that way? Diagnostically, sure. Routinely, not as much. I, I think just something to kind of add to your, your tool belt is to use this. It is a snapshot. How many of you have taken those leaf sample and said that is just squirrely? Yeah, it, it, it makes no sense. Cotton's another big one, right? Cotton's another big one. So you've got to do it over a course of time. One's not going to be enough because it is a snapshot. If you go into this idea that that one's going to tell me what I should do for the rest of the season, you're going to catch it, it turned a little dry that afternoon. It makes a marked difference in potassium levels, some of the nitrogen. So you've got to do it over a series of times. Okay? Some of the older uh, 
sufficiency range, just so you early, sorry, let me go back. Early, these are kind of those, what's sufficient in the leaf tissue, uh, not across uh, the macronutrients. And then you go into R2, so uh, full bloom or so. Uh, 3.2 to 5, we had a little bit of uh, a little coefficient. phosphorus with we'll say the ones, uh, you're going to enough. a little bit of a change. So this is R2. There's really no good nutrient sufficiencies for later growth stages, okay? So here I'm, I'm preaching right now, right? This R4, R5, R6, there's a lot going on later, but we don't have any really good sufficiencies, okay? So when you're taking these samples over time, it gives you an idea, okay, how are we doing? Now, we're not going to be at a level when we take an R, R4 or R5 sample and we've got a, a nitrogen, let's say it's at 3.1. Let's say it's at 3 if we use R2, it's going to say it's deficient. When it's really probably about on par, because what's going on when we go from R2 to R4 to R6? What are those leaves and nutrients doing? Yeah, they're remobilizing. So don't you think that the sufficiency level is going to change? Most certainly, okay? So next few slides just kind of give you that, that breadth of how this does change across your growing season, okay? So I've got both maturity group two and three set up here. Going across the list here so you can kind of catch that, that lime effect, that breeding effect, okay? This time the colors are matching up with the dark. The green's going to be R2, okay? Blue's going to be R4. Uh, saline soils that are also... Okay. I just want you to catch the trend, okay? You don't have to worry about individual dots. Just look at the, the individual lines, okay? Let's go with, uh, let's just do the, the threes, okay? You see a general what? This leaf nitrogen across modern lines. R2, you see what? Slight increase, right? R4, it's increasing as well. Go to R6, kind of that flat line. Then we start really increasing again. Go to 1960, and that transition point. Okay. So if you want to overlay what that R2 sufficiency range would be, so the R2, any of the modern lines, they're they're definitely sufficient. There there there's more than ample amounts there. You look at the R4 again. I'm using this yellow box as just R2 sufficiency. Okay. So as you go to the next growth stage, it should probably tick down a little bit and tick down a little bit more. Uh, modern lines are still mighty good with R4. Look at the R6s. Some additional Four lines, so 1970s right there below it. And we're talking 3%. And then the new lines are increasing. Okay. So again, we're, we're kind of within that ballpark, but is it enough? That, that's really the question that we're trying to drive at in the, the coming studies. Uh, that's leaf nitrogen. You know, how many actually apply nitrogen on soybeans? Okay, and what do you do? Again, because I'm learning from you as you're learning from me. Okay. So we can get the So you're doing pre and a foliar spray or I mean a broadcast? No, we 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 have done foliar. Okay. Sure. I'm starting in about the late eighties when they were studying erosion and crusting and all. Um, was that um, in regions of high range, okay. and then it's 50 inches. It depends on the, on the yield that we're shooting for, and whether it's irrigated or not. We're doing starters, and we're seeing an increase in that, and we're also using a lot of color now. Okay. We saw that flag with a little bit more on Okay. And on the starter, what are you looking at in terms of is it 1034 is mixture? Is it 28? Okay. Okay. And then, yeah. Ma'am, you had one too. Is that so? Okay, uh, with what product? Looked at. Ammonium sulfate. <laughs> Question mark. Maybe some dispersion due to or a low electrical conductivity. Again, I, I just kind of. So some of the same problems people experience in this range, sodic but not saline, folks claim they're seeing here. And, and the data supports it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about. Okay. Um, Got, I got 12 bushel gains. I'll go ahead and say it right now um, since you guys brought up. It's the uh, ammonium sulfate is where we've started to see some of this. I've never, never anticipated seeing a sulfur response in soybeans. It's wheat. It's corn. Soybeans, I might get a tissue difference, but nothing yield-wise. <laughs> some of our soil. So in, uh, These are it's not like that will not get close to one another. 
And when they dry out, they'll basically... We've got the Missouri Peninsula is where it's really good dirt, but then we've got some black sands, we've got some sands, we've got some fragile pan like soil, so we get a little bit of everything. This year, our soil study, we had a black sand, about 2, 2.5% two organic matter, and malic extraction was 5 parts per million sulfur. Okay, very low. We had 12 bushels with ammonium sulfate. I've never heard of anyone getting that kind of yield response on soybeans with sulfur. Yeah, I, I got sulfur mag. We've played with some of that too. Okay. So what I'm driving at is that we need to think outside. Maybe you guys are doing a little bit better job of that because you got some tougher dirt than we do. It's a new thing about the A lot of times, we'll ions, but each of those ions is high. Is put out two crops. So if you've got a lot of, of ion in your system, like sodium, that has a big hydrated ionic radius, uh, you can't get enough close enough to the surface that they're right against it. So in fact, there's a cloud of negativity around a clay. All right? Yep. So, so you get a driver on the sulfur side. Again, I'm, I'm catching a little bit of that probably the tail end of this talk to a little bit tomorrow as well. It's on the phosphorus. You know, it's not as marked as what we anticipated uh, in the leaves, at least. Modern lines uh, holding out with R4, R6. Potassium. This is one a lot of people talked about nutrients of soybean, and they're like, potassium is going to be the one. I mean, they always say potassium is going to be the one. And this is one where I've seen more mixed bag results than anything else, at least with our data. Okay? We need it. There's no doubt about it. But in terms of kind of this general change across the, the release years with the uh, growth stages as well as time, uh, we've got some that are increasing. Of negativity. Two. We've got others that are big over time. We've got uh, two that's a decreasing effect. We've got R4 that's increasing. So I made that comment about the, the water. That's what happens when your soil is sodium affected or too high magnesium. Kind of bring that out as an FYI. I think that's sulfur. Yeah, so we'll talk a little sulfur now. So. So they're showing that same upward trend across uh, release years, R2, R4, R6, uh, pretty marked increase. Um, again, that's, that's falling right in line with the leaf nitrogen. It's also falling right in line with the whole plant nitrogen, uh, leaf color you talked about. So in 2015, we had a wet year. And so this is actually the black sand I'm talking about. Um, 2015, we had a June where we got 20 inches. So like some of your September's can be, right? So we had 20 inches. And on the sand, we didn't have any standing water. We just had saturated conditions, OK? Catch the difference. No, sat, no, no standing water, just saturated conditions. Same field, rice rescue. This is called our rice farm. We don't grow rice. It's Mary Rice Estate. But in a year like 2015, we thought we could, right? Would you believe, same field, same day, what growth stage is the top, do you think? At, guess, V something, what? V2, maybe? What do you think the growth stage at the bottom picture is? V4, V5. They're exact same growth stage. Four, both of them. Don't leave me, do you? It's just like a drought stress, okay? When you have saturated conditions, your roots are limited. You limit the amount of oxygen in the root profile. It burns up that photosynthate through respiration, and then it chokes itself out, essentially, okay? And so just like corn, you lose the lower leaves. So we lost the codlines, or we lost the trifoliates, or we lost the lower one or two trifoliates. Both exact same growth stage, V4. So the idea was, what can we do? treatment-wise on these rescue beans to at least put them close to the same level as these, what we call the happy beans. Okay, we had enough of an area to do 18 treatments on the uniformly poor, poor rescue beans. Okay, so about July 2nd, V4, you actually can see some of the prills of ammonium sulfate dry. Okay, as well, uh, we did, that's ESN and polymer coated urea. Some of these pictures aren't as good with uh, the uh, projector, but ammonium sulfate, 20 pounds of nitrogen. Again, I thought the they're in the water. An issue of nitrogen, having limitations to nodulation, fixation, rather than a sulfur supply issue. 
this is just kind of showing that sometimes we just get lucky when we put treatments out there and realize that it's something else completely different. So, okay. treatment 20 pounds. They have shown now the folks. Obviously, you're pretty close to the same number on the sulfur side. Urea, 40 pounds of nitrogen. They did look a little bit better. They had better no development, but you still had darker green leaves. Um, this, this is with that ammonium sulfate. When we came down to the yield, I think you guys have seen enough presentations where you see an asterisk, you, you pay attention to it, right? So, 18 treatments on this rescue study. Entry control, decent 50 bushel beans. These are our full season beans in northern uh, third of Indiana. We brought in the different nitrogen treatments, all in green, right? But the last two that pegged out on a six bushel gain, so we went from 50 bushel up to 56 bushel, was the ammonium sulfate treatment. Okay. Uh, published in the section of the uh, American Association of Ag Engineers by Zhang. He engineered the result. Mixed in 10 pounds of nitrogen in a foliar spray. It was a little grainy, okay? It probably wasn't 10 pounds of nitrogen, but it was certainly more than just five. And it still got six bushel. We played with Coron, we played with UAN, we did individual, uh, you know, task force. Yep. Fungicide, we brought in some biologicals, we did combinations. The only thing that pegged out was the sulfur on this black sand, okay? So the real question is, did we bring it back to life? Did we bring it to the level of the happy beans? So, again, we go from 50 to 56. Happy beans, I only had enough room to do, oh, eight treatments on happy beans that year. 18 on the rescue beans, eight on the good ones, okay? Unfortunately, the ones I selected, one was not ammonium sulfate, so I can't have that comparison. But we did it this year, okay? Untreated in the happy beans, 55 bushel. So the answer to the question was, yeah, we brought them back to life. We got that nitrogen and sulfur supply, got it right, and got them going, got them through that stress period. There's a shot in the arm to get them through that stress period to make up the ground, okay? That's really what I'm driving at on today's talk on the nutrient side of things. Uh, this year, so same, same farm, it's uh, oh, 600 acres of, uh, there. So we went to another field we rotated through, did three different sulfur studies, again, on black sand. And Peter's standing right, right. These pictures are hard to, to show in a presentation with sulfur, but you can peg every single one of these plots that had sulfur. Okay, It didn't matter if it was just five pounds of sulfur foliar or five pounds dry. Uh, we did rate responses with different sources. We also did uh, foliar sprays, different timing. And, of course, I'm working on this data this morning. I got a map. And so my stats uh, software, I have an update in my license. So unfortunately, I don't have stats, which is a card sin, right? But uh, I think they're going to show, hey, that's a little bit better yeah. picture. No sulfur, 20 pounds of sulfur, okay? And yeah, you guys might see this more than I do, typically. Here's the no stats, but I think it still drives the message home. Untreated control, this is 2016. Our best soybean year, by the, by the way. We're going to average 60 bushel probably at the state level. All right, so untreated control was about 48 bushel. We had 20 pounds of sulfur. Again, so we, we converted this to truly a sulfur study. 20 pounds of sulfur up front with uh, Micro Essentials 10, their 124010S. And then we did ammonium sulfate uh, here in green. And they look uh, 20 pounds of sulfur up front. Okay. So here's the plot. We go from 48 you can see to bushel. That. 12 bushels. Huge, huge gains, okay? We did foliar sprays. The rest of these are all foliar sprays, right? The idea is, okay, can we get something out there in the tank mix? Okay, getting some practical for you guys finally, all right? Can we get something out there in uh, an application? We're already going across the field. These are all nutrient solution alone. I did not tank mix them with glyphosate or fungicide with this study, but it's just proof of concept. That's the next step, right? You can reduce a trip across the field. So all these blues are five pounds of sulfur, okay, using ammonium sulfate, spray grade, right, at V4, R2, R4, R6. Okay, so we're going again from 48 bushel. But in this case, I, I agree. In the tilde. Okay, with a V4, R2. All right, that's that's pretty pretty good increase. Again, uh, I'm certain those are going to pull out stats-wise. What's interesting to me is the pink ones and the combination. Again, trying to say, okay, if we're going across here at V4 glyphosate spray, can we bring that in? Now we're going to have to talk about some pH issues with glyphosate or any other herbicide, but for now, 
Neutral wise, it seemed to play out. And coming across there are two in the march. A little bit the R3. Maybe we can get away with doing an R3 application as well. Those two combinations, two pounds of sulfur uh, each time, so 10 pounds in total, put us are not social mark as well. Okay. So just, again, maybe you guys don't get jazzed over 10 bushel in soybeans, but I do, 12 bushels. And, and the idea of trying to do something that's an in-season management that's not an extra trip uh, certainly trips my trigger, okay? Uh, we're, we're going to score these with the up versus the full trays. We did do, and I don't have them on here, we did do a rate response with microessential tin ammonium sulfate as well as we blended our own ammonium sulfate with elemental sulfur, Tiger, um, Tiger CR, no, just Tiger, XP, and then 5, 10, 20, 30 pounds of sulfur to kind of catch that break point as well. And then we had a later application with uh, a KTS type product, R5 application. Okay. Any questions so far on the, this kind of sulfur, what we're starting to see uh, up in Indiana way? The two green ones, so the AMS right here, 20 pounds sulfur up front, yes. It was actually over the top. The, the grower already planted, and then we just spread over. Get a chance to incorporate. Okay. And then all the, the blue and pinks are all foliar sprays. Okay. All right. You guys ever have any manganese issues? I kind of figured so. You know, I worked the coastal plains in, in North Carolina, and manganese came up all the time. So I thought this might be something of value to you guys. Again, modern lines are showing an increase in their manganese concentration. In terms of the overall R2, I mean, it didn't matter. They, they were all hitting it pretty well. Um, so then now we start to talk about sulfur, manganese. What kind of rates can we bring in? Can we do them in tandem or not? Uh, we're also playing around with the undercovers. Have you guys, has that made it down here yet? Undercovers is just a, an application technology, a way to get uh, a spray. And they basically canopy. Okay, Yield 360 came up with their Y drops. Have you guys heard of those? Their next set up on their riser is an undercover. So it's a bank of four nozzles that runs in the middle of the canopy. So we just, just got my rig uh, outfitted with that. And so we're just playing with that. Maybe we can, the manganese set up, Okay, we missed it with the broadcast when we should have, you know, 10 days ago. Can we get it in the middle of the canopy? Because manganese doesn't really work, doesn't move too well, right? Can we get it in the middle of the canopy and make up ground? That's kind of a next year study for us as well. Okay. Um, and then to, to wrap up on the, kind of some of these, what we've done in terms of these old soybeans to do, bringing enhanced fertility. So we decided to pick six of the cultivars so you can see this, this progression. It takes time for us agronomists within the academic world. I got 60 cultivars, now 25. Now we're down to six, okay? Now we're bringing everything across in a, a, a good design. So we've got two cultivars from the 70s, two from the 90s, two from the 2010s. We also do the maturity group three set in the same way to see if we've got an interactions with these foliar management, fertility management strategies. So I was supposed to be on good dirt, okay? This is on prairie soil. Now, 1970s First, cultivar. The company in Buffalo has a relationship with electric generating plants on, any electric generating plants on the East Coast was how he put it to me. They're going to market and ship FGD. On crappy ground. Untreated. Low P. Less than 10 parts per million. K, less than 85 parts per million. These are all male three extractions. Extremely low. Okay? So, I was not happy. But what do you do? You, you make lemonade with lemons, okay? And so, our fertility was a, a one crop removal rate. So, we use the micro essentials uh, with, with zinc. So, with their, their full package at 1240. I think yes, and then one one yes. in zinc with uh, one buffalo, five, buffalo. five pounds, and then K2O we did 120 pound using their aspire, which also included a little bit of boron. So it was really just kind of throwing anything and everything at it with some of these two fertilizers. All right. So what was supposed to be enhanced fertility became really <laughs> just enough. Okay, but is is extremely enlightening what we call. The modern lines tanked and untreated. They absolutely tanked. They looked horrible. 
So I've got the 1970, 1990, 2010. I've got both, both cultivars averaged in the background of that, okay? So at our how many nodes? Uh, the untreated here in yellow versus uh, the Hans fertility or one and a half X crop removal. 16 nodes, okay? Really no difference when you look at the plots. I couldn't peg them. Uh, I can tell which ones are the 1970 lines versus the modern. That, that's no question. But in terms of the fertility treatments, I couldn't figure it out. 1990s, uh, there was really no, no major. 2010s, 14, 14 and a half when you average across all the plants, right? They tanked. The, the, the vertical growth, the expansion of the leaves, they just did not look good at all. When we actually have fertility where it's supposed to be, so 15 and a half, 16 notes, okay? So what's one potential conclusion you can draw from that? Good guy. Let me set it up this way. When was fertility work done again? Here to defray. 70s. And if 1970 lines really didn't show any major difference in growth and development in what I'll call, this is technical, uber low, right? Uber low, phosphorus and potassium. We adopted a standard. Critical point might be a little bit different than one of our modern lines. I'm not saying it's absolute because we need to do calibration curves for that. There's no doubt about that. But it certainly draws the question, okay? And then some are saying, well, what? If they look ugly, what they yield? All right? So grain yield, we did get an increase with, even with those old lines. We went from 40 bushel beans to 52 bushel beans with fertility. Okay, well, that's awfully nice. So there was more than just, you know, this cosmetic. Uh, there wasn't any cosmetic, but there was that grain effect. 37% increase. We do go from now what was ugly, ugly beans with our modern lines at 45 bushel, which out yielded those old ones. The old ones look great. The modern ones still did okay in low fertility. Fine. Fertility to it, we're around 62 bushel beans. Okay? Again, pretty major change. So you got one thing that's talking about cosmetics and the way they look, but then another one when it comes down to the grain itself. Okay? So long story short is let's not sell our soybean short on fertility, okay? They can still yield well. I mean, this is cruddy, cruddy fertility levels and still doing pretty well, okay? Nice. Maturity of three was showing uh, the old lines, really the between awesome. fertility or no fertility. The modern lines went from the 53 bushel up to about 64, okay? 11, 12 bushel gains. Okay. Again, those aren't, I mean, there's a lot of growers in my area that 50, 52 bushel beans, they're still okay with. But yet, you know, the next meeting, they're like, I'm tired of my beans being stuck at 50 bushels. I hit 50 bushels in 1980. Right? What have you done different since 1980? Have you been fertility the same way? I know we're in Delmarva. I know we're in areas where nutrients are a big, big topic. I'm not saying go crazy with the number, but I'm saying at least know what your numbers are. Right, from the fertility standpoint on the soil to the tissue sampling and understanding that these... Um, with the time I've got left, I'm going to leave you with this one, one slide here. And uh, I'll also kind of be, have the teaser that the, we've done fertility by foliar management this year, and we saw some pretty interesting results. I'm going to share that tomorrow, uh, the bean breaking barrier talk. I'm going to use that tomorrow. All right, so what are we really looking at? Nutrient removal, I know a lot of people are, are going this, this way with yield maps, All right? So a 50 bushel bean crop, 3.3 pounds of nitrogen, 0.7 uh, pounds of P2O5, 1.2 K2O. Put sulfur in here because, again, we're starting to see this, 0.18. All right, so 50 bushel beans, we're moving 165 pounds of nitrogen. That's just grain is all we're talking about. You're going to a P2O5, 37, all right? K206, let's just go up to the 75 bushel range. What are we doing in, in terms of removal? 250 on nitrogen, 55 on P205, 90 units on K20. Sulfur, again, we're an area where you can probably start to really talk about that, 14 pounds. And dare I say 100. All right, you guys got some irrigation. You can probably start to think about getting close to 80, 90, 100 bushel beans. All right, we're pulling off 73 units of P205, 120 units of K20. And we're expecting these beans to get to this level with 1970 yield levels or lower fertility applications. 
So are we fertilizing for 50 or 75 bushel beans? Or are the beans just getting the scraps? Okay, just really more, more pondering thoughts, okay? Um, again, tomorrow's got some pretty interesting results with fertility that's matched up with foliar management. Uh, we ran 95 bushel beans this year, so it'll be fun to look at. I had the yield monitor hit 135 this year. What's that? You must have been choking up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. It was a full swath, and we didn't we didn't set the yield monitor to you know 20 foot when it was actually 40 foot or anything like that. Yes, sir. Yeah, we check protein and also the, uh, the general trend from an old, so 1920s to modern, is that the protein in the grain was decreasing. And so the nitrogen content was as well. What about the test weight? Test weight, I didn't look at. Test weight is just kind of a moving target to me. More seed size is a more appropriate way of looking at this. Seed size, uh, we're not getting a consistent trend because what happens in August and September? I think if we always had adequate soil moisture and good temperatures in August and September, I think our seed size would be increasing, but it's really all over the board with our environmental factors. 1.7? To yield like your 50 bushel beans, if you have 55 pound test weight versus 60, you'd have 55 bushel beans instead of 50. Just with that, just with test weight. So if we can find a way to make better test weight, yeah. um, be a cut them on time. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um, study, watch your uh, base saturation. Yep. You know, you know, be looking at base saturation and get your relationship right there. And especially when they we deal with a lot of them, uh, 10 percent, 10 percent. Yep. Uh, and phosphorus and. We're probably, I mean, in the real heavy soils, that had to be some heavy ground.